Hello fellow gamers. Today I'll be listing my top 12 favorite game consoles. Now, I know what you're thinking. I made a video like this last year, so you'll think that this list will be the same as the list in the other video. But it won't. Two weeks ago, I rented some games from Game Force. For those of you who don't know what Game Force is, let me explain. They're a game store located where I live in Aurora, Colorado. They're the best game store here. They sell video games from every generation. They have a huge collection of games from older game consoles, especially Nintendo 64 games. I bought and rented some games from this store, and that inspired me to make another top 12 video game consoles list. This is the last top 12 game consoles list I'll make. I still will not include 7th game generation consoles in this list, especially because it's pretty dangerous to do so, because of the fanboys of these consoles still being around. I also won't include handheld consoles in this list. I'll only include home consoles hooked to a TV. With all that out of the way, let's get on with the list. At number 12 is the most underrated console ever in my opinion. The Neo Geo. This console is a very unknown and obscure game console, and anyone who's heard of it will think it's a really bizarre piece of hardware. The cartridges for this console are absolutely ginormous and take up a lot of space. Even bigger is the controller. Anyone who sees this controller will reject it. But there's something you've got to know about this console. SNK, the company that made the Neo Geo, is an arcade company. They specialize more in arcades than they do in home video game consoles. The Neo Geo was SNK's way of bringing arcade machines to a home video game console. The Neo Geo was a great home arcade console. The arcade ports were really great and better than the ones you'll find on other consoles. The controller, although a pretty terrible controller, was a good way of replicating arcade controls. But I really love the Neo Geo's Pro Controller. This was the best way to replicate arcade controls, and is a very comfortable controller. Now, why didn't the Neo Geo sell well if it was such a good console? Well, it was too expensive, and that was SNK's fault. The hardware costed too much to produce. They tried to sell their hardware by releasing the Neo Geo CD in the mid-90s as its own console and not a stupid add-on. But unfortunately, that didn't work. At number 11 is the Sega Saturn. The Sega Saturn is often called the most underrated console of all time. I think it's the second most underrated right after the Neo Geo, because the Neo Geo is more obscure. Financially, this console was a failure, and Sega wasted a lot of money on it, and it set Sega in the path to dropping out of the console race. The launch date for this console was in the late spring of 1995. That was bad. Because no one wants to buy game consoles in the summer. The time people want to buy game consoles is in October, November and December. Because the holidays are around the corner. That's when everyone's willing to empty their wallets. Plus it was a more expensive console than the PlayStation and Nintendo 64. Sega's flagship series, Sonic the Hedgehog, didn't have any good games on this console to sell the console. The biggest reason for the Saturn's failure was Bernie Stoller in 1997 saying the Saturn is not Sega's future. That is what pulled the plug on the Saturn's lifespan. It's no wonder that most hardcore Sega fans nowadays want Mr. Stoller dead on a stick. Anyways, despite being a failed console with a short lifespan, the Saturn did have many hidden gems on it. The Sega Saturn started the concept of 2.5D platformers with a game called Bug released in 1995. It's a very fun and addictive game, but speaking of platformers, my favorite game on the Saturn, and most other people's favorite on the console, is a 3D platformer released in 1997 called Nights into Dreams. Nights into Dreams was to the Sega Saturn what Mario 64 was to the Nintendo 64 and what Crash Bandicoot was to the PlayStation. If you could get your hands on this game, check it out. It's a great experience. As for the controller, I find the regular controller to actually be an inferior version of the Sega Genesis 6 button controller, but I absolutely love the 3D controller. It's very comfortable, and the joystick feels very nice. It's great for playing Nights into Dreams. At number 10 is the Atari 2600. Back in the 1970s, 
The first decade of video games, video games were far from what they are now, in the mid-70s during the first gaming generation, all you basically had were a bunch of punk clones. It wasn't until 1977 when the video game industry would change forever with the release of the Atari video computer system, later redubbed to the Atari 2600. The biggest innovation of the Atari 2600 was the use of interchangeable cartridges. Interchangeable game software was a big deal at the time. However, believe it or not, the Atari 2600 wasn't the first console with interchangeable cartridges. The first console with interchangeable cartridges was the Fairchild Channel F released in 1976. In an alternate reality, the Fairchild Channel F could have been what the Atari 2600 was in the real events. But what made the Atari 2600 kick off the gaming industry instead of the Fairchild Channel F was its marketing. Its advertisements on TV definitely boosted sales. Many of the Atari 2600 classics are still fun to play to this day. One example is Missile Command. All you're doing is shooting falling missiles before they touch the stones on the ground, and it's addicting as hell. Another great one that holds up to this day is Adventure. This is where the adventure genre started. We've came a long way from here, eh? Still, this is a very fun game, and the 4-bit graphics allow lots of imagination, and let's not forget about Pitfall. This is the game that really started off the platforming genre. Granted, it also almost killed the industry for good, especially with the infamous E.T. game, which is why the pioneer of game consoles is at number 10. At number 9 is the original Xbox. Now, before we get into the positives, let me first say that I used to really hate this console. Here's why. The console is ridiculously big, and takes up too much space. The Duke controller is absolutely atrocious. It's the console that started the path to the shooter generation with Halo, and most of all, it murdered my favorite game company ever, Rareware. However, I went to Game Force, and decided to buy an original Xbox to give it a chance. And I must say, I think I've been too hard on this console. I've come to appreciate it more for what it is. The Xbox is considered the spiritual successor to the Sega Dreamcast. Sega had a lot of games planned for the Dreamcast that never came because the Dreamcast's lifespan ended. So Sega ported those games to the Xbox so they could see some daylight. The mascot for Xbox was actually supposed to be Blinks, a character from a 3D platformer. It only became Master Chief because Halo was the only game that sold the Xbox. Blinks is a very fun 3D platformer that had remote control settings. Another great 3D platformer on the Xbox is Voodoo Vince, a very underrated and unknown platformer on the Xbox. But then there's the Holy Grail. Psychonauts. Psychonauts was also released on other consoles, but the Xbox version is just mesmerizing. This is hands down my favorite game on the Xbox. Now, let's talk about the controller. I already mentioned about how the Duke controller is absolutely atrocious, so terrible that they had to redesign the controller. As for the smaller controller, I think it's very comfortable and a really good design, but I'm not too fond of the breakaway cable. I do think it was a good concept for preventing you from dragging your console down when you yank your controller, but how easy would it be to yank the Xbox down considering how much of a giant beast it is. Last thing I want to talk about this console is modding. If you're a hacker, you will absolutely love this console, because it's so easy to mod. At number 8 is the Sega Dreamcast. This console was Sega's swan song. It had a short lifespan and was Sega's last console. But it has a huge fan base. During the console's short lifespan, Sega was doing all it could and let all heaven and hell break loose, and released exclusive after exclusive to get this console into homes. They'd even released the console in black to advertise the console as an ultimate sports gaming machine to show off the mature appeal of the console. Sega made it so that there was something for everyone on the Dreamcast. No matter what genre you were into. There was a Dreamcast game for you. If you were into platformers, you had Sonic Adventure. If you were into RPGs, you had Shenmue. If you liked sports games, you had NFL 2K. If you liked extreme sports games, you had Jet Grind Radio. If you liked driving games, then you had Crazy Taxi. If you like fighting games, you had Soul Calibur. 
saying it didn't go lazy at all. They made game after game to get the Sega Dreamcast into people's houses to make up for the financial failure of the Sega Saturn, but unfortunately, the Sega Dreamcast was more of a financial failure for Sega than the Saturn. They lost so much money on it they had to bail out of the console race. But despite its failure, the Dreamcast is a very popular and very loved console. Also it's pretty easy to get Dreamcast games nowadays, because you could burn them to CDs, and all Dreamcasts can read copied games. Also, Dreamcast games are still being made after the console's death. Some of them are surprisingly really good, like Gun Lord. At number 7 is the Nintendo GameCube. Probably Nintendo's most bizarre console ever, it has three main colors. The standard one being indigo, but the more common ones being the black and silver. The reason the black and silver are more common is because the indigo one looked like a baby toy, the black and silver ones looked like real game consoles. It also has the most bizarre format for games, which is mini DVD, while an infamous console for a lot of reasons. The GameCube was still a very good game console with some really good games on it. The GameCube game everyone immediately thinks of is Super Smash Bros. Melee for being the most epic fighting game of the 128-bit era. Another great game on the GameCube is Luigi's Mansion, which is like Resident Evil with Mario characters. Its exclusive 3D platformer was Super Mario Sunshine. It was a very fun game despite being the black sheep of the 3D Mario series. And then there's the Holy Grail. Metroid Prime, my favorite game on the GameCube. Metroid Prime is just a phenomenal first-person action-adventure game that is just absolutely epic and badass. This game is just great. The best thing about the GameCube other than Metroid Prime is the Game Boy Player. This add-on allows you to play Game Boy Original Color and Advance games on your TV screen. Well, this video ended up being pretty long. Looks like I'm going to have to split this video into two parts. In this part, I went over my top 12 through 7 game consoles. The next part of this, which will be uploaded roughly the same time as this one, will be my top 6 game consoles. Stay tuned.